its biosphere is primarily a closed system in terms of water, minerals, and nutrients. There are finite amounts of these substances which are recycled through the living and geological components of biosphere called a biogeochemical cycle. Carbon, a key element of organic life on Earth, cycles through the biosphere in this way. A constant absorption of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by photosynthetic organism and its conversion to carbohydrates by photosynthesis is key to sequestering carbon in the biotic environment. The breakdown of glucose by respiration or burning converts the carbon back to carbon dioxide, releasing it back into the atmosphere. These two processes contribute to carbon cycle because there is a finite amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Nutrient cycling such as this is essential to life on Earth. When viewed as a biogeochemical cycle, one can see how the carbon cycle is a balance of carbon stores. Nitrogen is one of the most important constituents of all living organisms from bacteria to man. Animals obtain required amount of nitrogen by eating plants and other animals. Plants obtain nitrogen from either soil and air. Air has large amount of nitrogen and its element form. However, plants cannot use nitrogen and its elemental form, so nitrogen should be converted to compounds like ammonia, nitrites, and nitrates in order to be used. After converting this into organic substances, plants utilize them for growth. When animals eat these plants, these substances enter into animal body. When animals or plants are decomposed by the bacteria, nitrogen is released into the atmosphere. This is called the nitrogen cycle. The types of decomposers. A decomposer is organism that breaks down dead organisms. Decomposers help recycle matter in an ecosystem by breaking down decaying or dead organisms. Example is this banana. Like other consumers, the composers are heterotrophic. They use other organisms to get their energy, carbon, and nutrients for growth and development. There are four main types of decomposers, fungi, insect, worms, and bacteria. Fungi break down and recycle organic material by predigesting. Fungi produce enzymes that break down and digest decaying dead matter and then absorbs this material. This process depends on water. Example of fungi is mushroom. Worms are also decomposers. They play an important role in producing our soil. Earthworms help decompose organic material and help make nutrients like phosphate more readily available. Here are examples of earthworms.
bacteria are tiny organisms and they are considered the kings of decomposition. Bacteria are found almost everywhere and every object on planet Earth. They help release important nutrients that living organisms have absorbed and they release these nutrients back to the environment like nitrogen and phosphate. These are examples of bacteria. Several insects like flies, beetles, and ants are the composers and break down living organisms. Example is this beetle. Several major groups are those that feed in dead or dying plant tissues. those that feed on dead animals and those that feed on excrement of other animals. Here are examples of insects that are decomposers. Ecologists study the process of decomposition by designing experiments that follow the decay of dead plant and animal tissues through time. The most widely used approach is the use of litter bugs to examine the decomposition of dead plant tissues. Litter bugs are mesh bugs constructed of synthetic material that does not readily decompose. The holes in the bug must be large enough to allow the composer organisms to enter and feed on the litter but small enough to prevent the composing plant material from falling out of the bag. Although this compromise in mesh size typically restricts access to the larger decomposer organisms. As the composer organisms consume the litter using the carbon as a source of energy, the carbon is eventually lost to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide in the process of respiration. It is important to note, however, that in this approach of studying the composition, as time passes, the mass of organic matter remaining in the litter bag includes original plant material as well as the bacteria and fungi that have colonized and grown on the plant litter. Organic matters of different decomposition rates. Decomposition rates are influenced by quality of plant litter substrate and features of the physical environment. Quantity of carbon compounds affect the quality of plant litter. Although carbons make up 40 to 60 percent of the dry weight in plants, its quality and quantity of energy available for decomposers are not the same. Glucose are high quality source of carbon. On the other hand, cellulose and hemicellulose have low energy source since it is difficult to decompose because of their complex structure. Lignins, in particular, are low quality of energy source that it does not gain energy to microbes in decomposition and thus they cannot degrade it. It is the job of the basidium mites to degrade lignin. Since lignin is a low quality of energy source, the proportion of its carbon content serves as the index of litter quality for decomposers and has an inverse relationship with decomposition rate. Physical environment also affect the rate of decomposition. Warm, wet climates tend to have high decomposition rate since microbes favor warm and moist environment. Decomposing organisms colonize the plant litter. As the litter is consumed, a significant proportion of carbon is respired and nutrients bound in organic matter are mineralized and released to the soil. Plant carbons are converted to mineral nutrients in the process of immobilization. Difference between mobilization and immobilization is the net mineralization rate. Residual organic matter in the litter bag is composed of growing proportions of microbial mass as the original mass of the plant is consumed and converted to microbial mass. 
The process of plant litter decomposition continues with the conversion of plant litter to dark brown or homogeneous organic matter known as the humus. This becomes embedded in the soil as soil organic matter. As decomposition continues, mass loss increases as decomposers consume the plant litter. Immobilization from soil results in the increase in nitrogen in the litter bug. With the increased consumption of plant litter, a significant portion of carbon is lost due to microbial respiration. The remaining portion is assimilated and converted to microbial mass. Mass loss increases with the increase in the nitrogen concentration of residual organic matter. The continuous decrease in carbon and increase in nitrogen proceeds in the development of humus and soil organic matter. Decomposition in aquatic ecosystems follows a pattern similar to that in terrestrial ecosystems. As in the terrestrial environments, decomposition in aquatic ecosystems also involves leaching, fragmentation, colonization of detrital particles by bacteria and fungi, and the consumption of detritivores and microbes. Plant litters located in the coastal environments decompose rapidly since they are more accessible to detritivores and stable environments is more favorable. Shedders are aquatic arthropods that breaks down organic particles and eats bacteria and fungi on the surface of the litter that are found in the flowing water ecosystems. Filtering and gathering collectors, on the other hand, are found downstream. They filter water from fine particles and fecal material that are left by the shredders. Grazers and scrapers feed on algae, bacteria, fungi, and organic matter collected on rocks and large debris. Bacteria work on the bottom or benthic organic matter. Some can carry on aerobic respiration. Beneath a few centimeters, an aerobic respiration occurs which proceeds at a slower rate. Aerobic and anaerobic decomposition in the benthic environment form only a part of the decomposition process. Dissolved organic matter, or DOM, provides sources of carbon for decomposition. Macroalgae, phytoplanktons, and zooplanktons inhabiting the open water are the major sources of DOM. They inhabit the open water. Ciliates and zooplanktons eat bacteria and excrete nutrients in the form of exudates and fecal pellets. These pellets provide substrate for further bacterial decomposition. An important component of the nutrient cycle is the microbial loop, wherein the DOM is reintroduced to the food web by being incorporated into bacteria which then are consumed by ciliates and zooplanktons. The cycle depends on the process of primary production and decomposition. Primary productivity determines the rate of nutrient transfer from inorganic to organic form, and decomposition determines the rate of transformation of organic nutrients to inorganic. Interdependence of both factors is the key process that limits the rate of internal cycling of nutrients. Reduced nutrient availability can have the effect of reducing both the nutrient concentration of plant tissues and net primary production. It lowers the total amount of nutrients returned to the soil in dead organic matter. The reduced quantity and quality of organic matter Entering the decomposer food chain increases immobilization and reduces the availability of nutrients for uptake by plants. Nutrient cycling is an essential process in all ecosystems and represents a direct link between net primary production and decomposition. Varying link occurs between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. There is a separation between zones of production, photosynthesis, and decomposition. In terrestrial ecosystems, the plants are the ones that bridge the physical barrier between the decomposition zone at the soil surface and the productivity zone in the plant canopy. The roots are the ones that provide access to the nutrients of the soil through decomposition at the vascular system within the plant transports the nutrients to the sites of production. In aquatic ecosystems, plants do not always function to bridge the zones of production and decomposition. In the shoreline, plants such as cordgrass and cattails bridge the zones of decomposition and production. The plants extend up to the water column in the photic zone, the shallower waters where light levels support higher production. As water depths increase, 
Primary production is dominated by free-floating phytoplanktons within the upper waters. The benthic zone is physically separated from the surface waters where temperature and light availability support primary production. The separation between the zones where nutrients become available through decomposition and the zone of productivity where nutrients are needed to support photosynthesis and plant growth is a major factor controlling the productivity of open water ecosystem. The vertical structure of open water ecosystems can be divided into three distinct zones. The epilimnion or surface water is warm because of the interception of solar radiation. Oxygen levels are high because of the diffusion from the atmosphere into the surface waters. The hypolimnion or deep water is cold and is low in oxygen. Thermocline is the transition zone between the surface and deep waters which is characterized by a steep and temperature gradient. Vertical structure and physical separation of epilimnion and hypolimnion have important influence on distribution of nutrients and subsequent patterns of primary productivity in aquatic ecosystems. The colder, deeper waters where tip composition occurs are nutrient-rich as compared to surface water. However, this zone where temperatures and light support high productivity. With the breakdown of thermocline and mixing of water column, nutrients are brought up from the bottom surface waters. Seasonal dynamics in the vertical structure of open water ecosystems in the temperature zone. Winds also mix the water within the epilimnion during the summer, but the thermocline isolates this mixing to the surface waters. With the breakdown of thermocline during the fall and spring months, turnover occurs allowing the entire water column to become mixed. This mixing allows nutrients in the epilimnion to be brought up to the surface waters. The continuous directional movement of water affects nutrient cycling in stream and river ecosystems. Nutrient spiraling is a continuous transport of nutrients downstream in a spiral manner rather than a cycle. A spatial cycle is an added element of flowing water. Organic matter, like nutrients, is constantly being carried downstream. These materials are quickly carried downstream and are dependent on two factors such as how fast the water moves and the physical and biological factors that hold nutrients in place. Physical retention involves the storage in wood detritus such as logs and snags, in debris caught in pools behind logs and boulders, in sediments, and in patches of aquatic vegetation. Biological retention occurs through the uptake and storage of nutrients in animal and plant tissue. The process of recycling, retention, and downstream transport may be pictured as a spiral lying horizontally or longitudinally in a stream. One cycle in the spiral is the uptake of an atom of nutrient, its passage through the food chain, and its return to water for further use. Spiraling is measured as the distance needed to complete one cycle. The tighter the spiraling, the longer the nutrients remain in place. The buildup of sediments creates alluvial plains about the estuary, giving rise to mudflats and salt marshes that are dominated by grasses and small shrubs rooted in the mud and sediments. Nutrient cycling in these ecosystems differs from that of terrestrial, open water, and stream ecosystems. Circulation of fresh water and salt water in an estuary functions to trap nutrients. A salty wedge of intruding seawater on the bottom produces a surface flow of lighter fresh water and a counterflow of heavier brackish water. These layers are physically separated by variations in water density arising from both salt concentration and temperature differences. The zone of maximum vertical difference in density, the pycnocline, functions much like the thermocline in lake ecosystems. Living and dead particles settle through the pycnocline 
into the counter current and are carried up estuary along with their nutrient content, conserving the nutrients within the estuary rather than being flushed out to sea. The transport of deep, nutrient-rich waters to the surface in the coastal regions is brought about by the global pattern of surface currents. Deep water moves to the surface, carrying nutrients with it, as surface currents move waters away from the western coastal margins. A similar pattern of upwelling, wherein surface currents move to the north and south, is observed in equatorial regions of the ocean.